When the dying patients and the surgeon's load became too great to bear alone, he could escape to a farm he had bought on a lake not far from Montreal and to the happier responsibilities of a husband and a father. reminded him of Wisconsin and of his own childhood and the lessons he'd learned there as a small boy. His father, he was a doctor too. But he had abandoned his family to chase after big game trophies and pretty female patients. It was his mother, the strong one, who raised him on romantic dreams and stern moral lessons in a small town called Hudson, Wisconsin, where her family, the Jeffersons, were leaders. Her father was the town banker. Pious and penny-pinching, Amos Jefferson was a powerful model for his fatherless grandson. To my mind, Hudson was not a small, faraway town at all. It was the happy place. From it, roads led out to all the world. Or so it seemed on those summer evenings as we sat together, my mother and I, and talked on the front porch while the street lights came on and the breeze caused the branches of the elms to sway back and forth. Those elms were a source of pride to us. We were the lucky ones who lived on 3rd Street in Hudson. Down the street was the Presbyterian Church, where he learned about his immortal soul and that God had a purpose for everyone, especially for him. His mother spent a lot of time at the church. She took him to prayer meetings. She taught a Bible class. Wilder was always her best student, and she hoped that one day he would be called to be a minister. It was at the church that she heard a Rhodes Scholar, and her plans for Wilder suddenly found a focus. To win a Rhodes Scholarship, all I had to do in the next eight years was to make myself into an all-around scholar and athlete and leader of other boys. Mother had the gift of making her son feel that she believed in him. Just in case faith was not enough, she started her own school, where boys would be trained to be strong, God-fearing, and pure. There were 12 little knights in Wilder's class, and with his mother's guidance, he was at their head. Captain of the football team, class valedictorian. His speech was on chivalry. He grew up and left Hudson for bigger things, but he wrote to his mother every Sunday to share with her his victories and his defeats, and to ask her advice. She died in 1935, but the connections to the world of his youth continued through a hometown girl, Helen Kermot. He courted her through high school, and they were married in 1917. They spent their honeymoon working in a Red Cross hospital. Now they had four children of their own, and in their home movies, the children appointed her director and made him play the villain. In 1945, science brought the world into a new era. After this, nothing would seem impossible. Science was the new religion, and to the public, scientists had become high priests, champions of the brave new world. At the Montreal Neurological Institute, years of tireless effort had borne fruit. The puzzling deaths were now rare. As treatment and care improved, Patients came from everywhere, seeking relief from their epilepsy. As the operation became famous, the surgeon's public statements became the stuff of headlines and popular fantasy.
Surgeons and scientists, too, came from around the world to join the team at the Institute studying the brain and treating its disorders, and to work with Wilder Penfield, the team's undisputed leader and guiding light. The wonderful thing about working with a man of this sort, of course, is that it's contagious. If you have a leader, you can't help but feeling that importance of he lifts people a little out of the ordinary life, everyday life. He was always himself setting a pace. Uh, he was like the stroke in a, in a, in a, a rowboat. You, you, you had to keep up with him. So he set the, the, the pace of the work. Uh, and in that sense, he was uh, inspiring. Uh, many people, I think, found him perhaps uh, too demanding, but that was... Uh, uh, a question of what level of activity are you prepared to dedicate to this field. His operating room at the Institute was his laboratory. Each operation was a fresh opportunity to discover something new about how the brain works. Make it one ball, please. One bolt. Yeah. With one bolt. Point four. Repeat it. Watching face. From meticulous now. records of thousands of operations, they had put together strange diagrams that showed how the different parts of the body were represented in the brain. They had located the control centers for smell and speech, sight and hearing. They had found that the hand required a very large area of the brain and yet the leg took up very little. Their discoveries had made the Institute famous, and Penfield's name had become a household word. There were invitations from exclusive societies and honorary degrees from distinguished universities around the world. The newspapers were calling him the greatest living Canadian. In 1953, the awards were capped by the highest civilian honor in the British Commonwealth the Order of Merit. A mild electrical current. His 60th uh, birthday had come and gone, and he was getting restless. He and his colleagues had solved many of the problems that had puzzled him as a young surgeon. The brain was no longer such a mystery, and every day their understanding was growing. His work had made Montreal and Canada famous around the world. There was talk of a Nobel Prize. But there were questions that their maps of the brain had not answered. And to him, they were the pressing questions. Where in the brain were the intangible things? Where were thoughts, dreams, love, and hate? Was there a place in the brain that made him believe he had a mission in life? That made him believe in God? So far, he had tried to keep these thoughts to his diary. The complexity of the brain seems to paralyze one's thoughts. We are like the ancient wise men who looked at the heavens. For many centuries, we shall probably come closer to the truth by jumping the whole physical complexity and inferring the existence of a soul and of a god. An act of faith, perhaps. There must be a soul somehow related to this extraordinary mechanism. Dr. Penfield incorporated his profound religious views into his attitude towards scientific work. He tried to harmonize the two. Of course, this is what caused him a great deal of trouble, too, because it's not easy. This was a great struggle for him in his thinking, as it is for everyone, as it has been for everyone since anybody thought of God. But he didn't avoid the subject. He couldn't avoid the subject. But it seemed less and less likely that scientists would come up with satisfactory answers in his lifetime. And as a scientist, there were strict limits to where he could let his speculations take him. He needed another outlet. And on his desk lay a manuscript for a novel, a biblical romance about Abraham and Sarah, his mother had started it, and he had promised to finish it. 
Now it seemed a more suitable place to speculate about faith and God, and he worked at it with growing enthusiasm. He did ask me to dive with him and uh, said that he wanted to write a novel. He the time and he wished to have a new profession. When Novelist he Hugh McLennan. And I was somewhat skeptical because I did say to him, you know, doctor, I think the, the writing of a novel is a very complex thing. And I don't think anybody can teach anybody to do it, but I think it's just as difficult. It'll take just as long to learn how to write a competent novel, the craft of it, as would be to become a neurosurgeon, which at that time I don't suppose it made much sense to him, but at any rate, I think it did later. The novel was published in 1954. Its reception opened his eyes. It did well in Canada, where his name was already well known, but elsewhere, stories about the Old Testament fell on deaf ears. Society was changing. He realized that the safe, orderly world of his childhood was gone forever. The churches were empty. The bars and nightclubs were full. In 1955, he went to a Broadway play and saw what the world looked like to a modern writer. The writer was Tennessee Williams. And the play was his popular hit, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. It was explicit in its portrayal of infidelity, homosexuality, alcoholism, and lust. He emerged from the theater a few hours later, his worst fears confirmed. It seems to signify that degradation is rising like a horrid river to wash away good things in our civilization. Everything that is good is made of no account. The church, family, affection, love, integrity, all laughed at. It is after two o'clock in the morning. The cursed play has kept me awake. If this is good drama and literature, then I am all wrong. I want to be a writer, but what can an impotent old man like me do to save the souls and spirits of mankind? Better stick to saving bodies from death and think nothing of the minds of men nor worry about their ideals. But why save them? For what? They can take up the thinking about the mechanisms of the brain where I leave off. I want to write beautifully, be admired, much read. I suppose that's a silly bit of vanity. I want to be handsome, have thick curly hair, sparkling talents. I like to run a mile in four minutes to dance better than other men. I've spent my life searching for the truth in medicine. I shall turn to a more important sphere of thinking. I shall work at it in my own way. I'd rather do that than earn the Nobel Prize for scientific achievement. This makes me a man of less scientific stature, but I do not care. Another novel, this one a story about Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. The hero was a thinly disguised Wilder Penfield. In 1959, he retired from medicine to become a full-time writer on subjects that ranged from bilingualism and early language learning to essays on the modern world and what was wrong with it. And when he wanted a change of pace, there were goodwill missions for the Canadian government to China, India, Pakistan, 
and the USSR. But each time he returned, it was to a society in which those who wanted to trade in the old order were getting impatient. In 1962, it was a terrorist bomb in a mailbox a few blocks from his home in Montreal. The turmoil was worrying other eminent Canadians. Among them, a couple he had met a few years before under happier circumstances at a cocktail party in Montreal. The Governor General and his wife, Pauline Vanier. Instead of saying even how do you do to him, I said, Dr. Benfield, can you tell me where the soul is? He looked at me, his his eyes, as he always does, and looked at me as if I was a little bit. And he said, can't answer that just now. And actually, the conversation ended like that because I was so frightened and nervous that I, I turned away from him and I thought, oh dear, what have I said? But I think that started a, a link between us. I mean, he felt that... Um, there was something that I was interested in that he himself was also very mystified about. They shared, too, a belief that a strong traditional family unit was the best guarantee of a healthy society. They saw modern families threatened by growing permissiveness and agreed that those who knew how it should be ought to speak out. Mind you, it was not that they were against romance. Um, I loved the little incident, for instance, coming back from a reception. I was sitting in front of the car, and he was at the back with his wife. And I looked in the mirror. Mrs. Penfield had a bunch of beautiful roses, and they were both hidden behind the roses and kissing one another. And I think that a couple who were well over 70 who still had that romantic feeling, proved that he was a family man and that he would try and do everything to have the world understand family life that he had held it and wanted it. They formed the Vanier Institute of the Family. He was its first president. For four years, he traveled the country with Helen, speaking to anyone who would listen. You teach your children um, according to what you think is right. Don't, that's a man's right. And he keeps out of the door. He closes the door against what he wants to keep out. He's got to learn to do that with TV and radio and, and newspaper and movie and all of the other influences that he think are, thinks are bad for his family. I think we need to do what... Uh, the communists have done for the country in each family and keep out in, in, in a circle and you may then uh, find that you go back to reading and writing and even talking. You think it's likely that this is going to happen? Mm. It must happen uh, or we're going to be lost. Saints are not comfortable people to live with. Uh, His son-in-law, Crosby man. Lewis. Was Walter Penfield a saint? In that sense, yes. He was a sort of secular saint. He, he, he was obdurate in his own moral principles. And he never would have considered um, bending, uh, much less uh, turning around on them. He was incorruptible in that regard. And he, the other aspect of his sainthood, I would suppose, was that he not only felt this way himself, but felt it a duty to inflict it, if you will, on others. And then one day he looked at himself and saw an old man talking to a world that wasn't listening. As his 80th birthday approached, he withdrew from the Vanier Institute and with Helen retreated to an apartment overlooking Montreal and began to write his memoirs. He had much to be proud of. The Montreal Neurological Institute was planning an expansion to be called the Penfield Pavilion.
The research he had started had been taken up by others and was moving ahead in directions he could never have anticipated. Can I, can I have you just follow my finger with your eyes? Just look at my finger. Their work offered hope to thousands of patients who only 50 years earlier would have been considered beyond treatment. The world was grateful, and his place among Montreal's pioneers was assured. But there was still one more job to do, one last question to be answered. And to Wilder Penfield, as the end approached, it was the most important question of all. Well, I think he was driving to find out what man really was for. Why was man? Was there an ultimate reason for man? Or, or was man just a temporary thing that was going to pass through the life of the world? I think he was searching that, um, the ultimate. Even with all our progress and advanced techniques and his insight into how the brain works, in the end, after a lifelong work on the subject, we still were a long way from solving this problem. So he began to think it's not possible to solve it. All my life I've expected to emerge somehow from brain to mind. All my studies of the brain in the past were worked out with the secret hope that I would see more clearly in the end. I do not doubt that there is some purpose to life and I seek the answer now before my mind goes numb. The die is cast. He came out to the farm to write. Out here, he had created peace and order, an order he had, in the end, found nowhere else, neither in science, nor in the world beyond these quiet walkways, the sound of these bells, beyond these hills. He set out, as his last effort, to write a book that would impress this order on his life's work. The establishment of an institute was, in the end, so small a part the overall objective was to do what I'm trying to do alone in this book, The Mystery of the Mind. In the book, he would review the detailed records of 2,000 operations, their search for the causes of epilepsy, for the brain mechanisms that control the body, their diagrams of the brain, and their strange encounters with memory. On a rock below his writing shed, he had painted, in crude house paint, the theme of the book. The Greek word for spirit, and a line connecting it to the Esculapian torch, representing science, and to a drawing of the human head, inside it the outline of a brain, at its center, a question mark. They had discovered much, he wrote, but nowhere Neither in their surgery nor in their research had they discovered in the brain a physical mechanism to account for the human spirit. Completing this book and his memoirs took him right up to the end. In April 1976, he entered hospital for surgery on an intestinal tumor. His daughter, Ruth Mary Lewis, but I, in the ambulance going there, he gave me his cane and said, I won't need this anymore. But maybe I'd better have it while I'm in the hospital. And uh, his hat he kept, he took right into, the, into his room with him, hung it up on the back of the door. And uh, first day in the hospital, when I went in to see him in the morning, he said, you know, I didn't have to get dressed this morning. 
Wilder Penfield died on April 5, 1976, at the age of 85, shortly after The Mystery of the Mind was published. In the end, the book had not been a scientific review. It had been a statement of faith. He had come full circle. It was the voice of Gene Penfield's son. I was brought up in a Christian family and I've always believed that there was work for me to do in the world and that there was a grand design in which all conscious individuals play a role. Whether there is communication between man and God and whether energy can come to the mind of a man from an outside source after his death is for each individual to decide for himself. Science has no such answers. Seven, a slight feeling in the owner of three fingers again. <laughs> 